within minutes. They were aloft, screaming westward at Mach 4 speeds to Valhalla Mountain. We, the new X-Men, were officially on our first mission. The jet was filled with so many emotions that day, but more than anything else, we were ready. Ah, Jean. Did I ever tell you that Count Nefari had tried to blast us right out of the sky? Cyclops maneuvers the jet around the mountain to shake the three missiles. Yet they strike the jet still. Cyclops hits an eject switch and Storm and the X-Men break away in an escape pod. Count Nefaria, however, fires again. Sonic Disruptors quickly disintegrate their escape pod, and Storm and the others are left in free fall, miles above the ground, with only 90 seconds to go before impact. Storm, Banshee, listen up! Cyclops orders. Each of you grab a non-flyer and head for the ground! Storm summons a gust of wind strong enough to slow everyone's descent. Don't worry! She shouts back. My winds can carry us all easily! I can get down on my own! Colossus says. Grab the Wolverine! And as Storm does, she watches her friend Colossus as he pushes his body down and like a torpedo colossus crashes into the ground for a moment all is but sound and fury the force of the impact cracking down the mountain as storm and the others descend toward colossus's crash site Banshee fears the worst for Colossus, thinking the Russian giant had effectively killed himself. For when the echoing sound fades and the fury of his crash landing finally dies, Colossus is nowhere to be seen. Peter, are you there? Storm shouts. Are you alright? Peter! Why are you yelling, Sister Aurora? Colossus shouts back. Of course, I am all right. Minutes later, inside tunnels deep beneath the Valhalla mountain base. Team enters. Storm can feel her body begin to become ticks. The tunnels are very narrow, and the small space, crowded with she and the others, in her claustrophobic. But she dares not think of it. She steals herself, breathes, and controls the growing tempest inside her. No one else must ever know of her soul weakness. Within only steps down the hallway, an ominous smoke cloud floats down the tunnel. Before they know it, it overtakes them, choking them, blistering, nearly blinding their eyes, tearing at their skin like acid, tearing at their minds. In a moment, they will all be dead, as if it was a single, simultaneous tinsel burst through a wall in the tunnel to feed them where they are met by military soldiers who open fire on them. Colossus blocks most of the bullets with his metallic body. Cyclops, we cannot stay here! Storm shouts, sir. Colossus cannot defend us forever, and this gods will soon overcome us! 
You think I don't know that, Storm? Cyclops snaps back. But we can't hurt those soldiers. Look at them. They've been hypnotized. I see. Storm says calmly. Very well. She lifts her hands into the sky. Her eyes glow white with electric energy. If you do not wish these soldiers hurt, she says, then they will not be hurt. Raw energy crackles in the still air. Lightning flares from her fingertips. But, but they, they will, will be stopped. A gust of wind springs up from nowhere in golfing storm. The winds gather the poisonous gas together, then disperses it amongst the soldiers. And before they can recover, there is a sound never before heard within the halls of Valhalla. The sound of a flood! It gathers the soldiers in as if the waters themselves are alive, gently sweeping them down the long corridors until they are no longer a threat to the X-Men, and then it sets them down and fades away as quickly, as quietly as it had been summoned. The soldiers will not bother us anymore. Come! We have no time to delay. Storm orders. Let us proceed, Cyclops. So far, our first mission was going great. Next, we defeated Count Nefarious and I men. They were no match for our teamwork. Cyclops had trained us too well, realizing that we had fought his plans of megalomania. Count Nafari had tried to make a desperate escape in a stolen fighter jet. Professor Xavier himself telepathically warned us to get outside. Something was going terribly wrong. Outside the control room where we had just disabled the Doomsmith command system, John had jumped onto Count Nefarious' jet. In the air above the Colorado mountains, Banshee can barely keep up with Count Nefarious' jet. He pleads jump from the aircraft, but Thunderbird does not yield. John Powell's star's hands rip deep into the Harrier's cockpit, ravaging control systems and computer and electronic hardware. It's a pounding that no plane was designed to take. Thunderbird, John, please! Xavier pleads telepathically. I insist you eject yourself on the plane! Now! Banshee, it's there to catch you. Storm, there they are! Cyclops says, spotting the jet. The professor says Banshee can't keep up! Get them out of there, fast woman! Storm summons the wings and streaks through the air. She knows she only has seconds to reach him. Her winds blast her through the sky at speeds she has never before attempted. Her heart pounds as she watches Thunderbird rip apart the plane. Sooner or later, something has to give. And soon something does. And suddenly... John, no! Goddess! No! Thunderbird! No! Simultaneously, in Westchester County, New York, nearly 2,000 miles east, the scenario ends as it began, with the breaking of Charles Xavier's heart and the further twisting of his already stained soul. For in the end, Xavier could not desert his troubled recruit, and everything John Proudstar felt in his dying moments, Charles Xavier felt as well. The deafening sound of the explosion, 
the sudden blinding light, the heat of the flames, the smell of burning flesh, the taste of jet fuel, smoke, metal and blood in his mouth, the fade to inevitable darkness. The only difference, Xavier alone survives the experience, and he screams and collapses. Back in Colorado, at the Valhalla base, Storm and the other new X-Men look on in horror. Storm can do nothing but stare at the wreckage, lost for words. Her teammate, her friend, had just died before her very eyes. Yet again, in her young life, death has followed her, yet only touched someone around. And now, John. Xavier sits in his wheelchair, lost in his thoughts. Thanks to Storm, none but the faintest hint of a breeze disturbs the morning air, not a sound. Storm and the X-Men have come here to the land of John Proudstar to return his body to his family and lay him to rest. Jean Grey joins the professor. She tells him that she knows how he is feeling. He'd stayed in mental contact with John while he died. And years ago, when she was only 10, Jean had experienced the same when she stayed in mental contact with her childhood friend Annie as she died from being struck by a speeding car. High above her new foster father and sister, Storm summons a gentle breeze as well as a soothing rain shower. Her attempt to console them all, and her attempt to cover her crying. Poor Charles. The professor may know more about the human psyche than anyone else on the entire planet. Yet I do not think even his mind will ever handle losing one of his X-Men. His students. His children. Ironically, or rather coincidentally, Xavier later learned that the Apache tribesmen had served with the, several of their fallen soldiers from the Bahala missile base mission. To them, his name was Corporal John Proudstar. He lived as a soldier. To us, he was known as Thunderbird. He died an X-Man. But to me, he was simply a friend, a man whose spirit will live forever in those that knew him. Um.